Well, Chris, we've uh, talked a lot about pancreatitis and uh, chronic pancreatitis, and now I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about pancreatic insufficiency, which usually is associated with chronic pancreatitis, but in some cases can occur independent of uh, the actual inflammation and destruction of the pancreas. So how do you make a diagnosis of pancreatic insufficiency? I think most patients, you would suspect it based on either the clinical features, which might be the weight loss or the steatorrhea or um, vitamin or mineral deficiency. Um, but it's oftentimes hard to prove uh, that they actually have exocrine insufficiency. The traditional bay way would be with a 72-hour fecal fat collection, which is very difficult to do. And I think most clinicians and most patients are not going to mess with that. And so we use uh, a proxy measures for exocrine insufficiency. Uh, one of the important ones, perhaps, is fecal elastase. We talked briefly mm -hmm. uh, about that. But a very low fecal elastase is suggestive of exocrine insufficiency. And if it's below 200 and certainly below 100, I think you can be reasonably confident that you're dealing with a patient with exocrine insufficiency. The other is a serum trypsin level. And when it gets below 20, again, it's highly suggestive of exocrine insufficiency. But in many of these patients, you may not know for sure. And my strategy is to err on the side of treating those if you're not sure. There is, I think, um, accumulating evidence that even in patients that have moderate degrees of steatorrhea, there is a nutritional price to pay for that with trace element deficiencies, fat-soluble vitamin deficiencies. And so I think it's prudent to treat patients even if you're not entirely sure, if you have some suggestion that they might have uh, disease. At the moment, as you know, we have uh, only three uh, pancreatic enzyme products <clears throat> which are available for commercial use. All are enteric-coated uh, preparations. And I think one of the biggest um, uh, mistakes that's made is under-treating patients. Uh, most textbooks suggest that we need about, about 30,000 units mm -hmm. of lipase per meal to achieve reasonable absorption of fat and fat-soluble vitamins. What was that based on? Well, it was based on some very uh, old studies uh, from the 60s uh, almost that identified this as the cut point. The challenge, I think, is that those studies utilized uh, international units, and the enzyme products that are currently available are in a different unit, a USP unit, which is about the third the size of a, uh, an international unit. So for us, it means you need around 90,000 units of lipase uh, delivered uh, during a meal uh, to achieve reasonable uh, fat absorption. And it's, it's impressive to me that that's only about 10% of what the normal pancreas can crank out. So the pancreas is spectacular at, at producing enzymes and delivering them at the right time into the duodenum. Another thing about those studies that's interesting is that was a test meal. And uh, I had the concept that what would happen is you'd eat a meal, the uh, pancreatic enzymes would come up for a little bit and then drop back down to normal. But if you study the normal pancreatic secretion during the day, it goes up to near maximal levels and maintains that level all day long and even into the evening and night. And it's not until the wee hours of the morning that it comes back to normal again. So the food slowly being released from the stomach uh, really... Uh, does stimulate the pancreas to produce an enormous amount of enzymes. And so even uh, 90,000 units is a fraction of what the pancreas normally makes. So I completely agree with you that we've had a tendency to grossly under-treat the, the patients. And uh, the other thing that I remember so much from my training is that alcoholic patients with uh, pancreatic insufficiency that were malnourished and vitamin deficiency, we blamed it on the alcohol. And in fact, it was our fault by not giving them the enzymes they needed to have normal nutrition and weight gain. And I don't know if, I, if I've seen data, but I know it in my own personal experience in patients that I see uh, when they come to my clinic, uh, three quarters at least are underdosed in terms of their enzyme therapy. So it's very, very common across the population, I think. And, and the challenge is, of course, that it takes a lot of pills. And so there's, a, there's difficulty with with patient compliance, but to just achieve sort of basic absorption of fat and fat-soluble vitamins, you really need a significant amount of enzyme uh, uh, products, which even for the most potent pills, 
you're talking three with meals or four with meals. Mm -hmm. I do encourage my patients to make sure that they take the pills during and immediately after the meal, uh, the meal to split them equally. That works better than taking them before the meal, so that helps, I think, in improving the fat absorption and fat digestion as well. Right. What's your threshold for initiating therapy? Um, it's a strong clinical suspicion is enough for me. So I don't require that uh, the fecal elastase is you know, very, very low. I don't require that the trypsin is very, very low. If I have a consistent clinical story, if I have evidence that points towards at least some fat malabsorption, say in a qualitative stain, a Sudan stain of stool, uh, if I have evidence of uh, metabolic bone disease, osteopenia, osteoporosis, a low vitamin D without any other explanation. So I have a fairly low threshold for treating uh, uh, these patients. Uh, how about you? When do you decide uh, to treat them? Yeah. So I think um, what, uh, what our practice is at University of Pittsburgh, it's a little bit uh, very uh, variable. Um, uh, there's a, a common interest in, in um, giving a trial of enzymes to see if symptoms of uh, bloating uh, or uh, uh, abdominal discomfort, uh, if they're having frequent bowel movements, if that helps that. Also, if uh, their weight is not being maintained uh, properly, uh, we also, in addition to looking at fat-soluble vitamins, look at vitamin B12 because the enzymes are necessary to digest our factor so that it can be absorbed. So if you don't have pancreatic enzymes, you can't absorb B12. And we've seen patients that have been referred to us that have neurologic features because of vitamin B deficiency and uh, what they've, or vitamin B12 deficiency, and they've been able to adjust their diet so that they don't have a lot of the uh, uncomfortable symptoms of maldigestion, yet they uh, have some profound uh, maldigestion of, of uh, fats and fat-soluble vitamins, and the consequences are, are seen not only with bone, but also uh, vitamin B12. And I think it is important when you're starting patients on enzymes to check fat-soluble vitamin levels. I usually check B vitamin levels as well, so you know kind of where you're starting, and oftentimes you're surprised. They're deficient in B12 when you start. They're deficient in vitamin D when you start. And so even where I live in Florida, many of these patients are vitamin D deficient. So I think it's prudent to check those and then to supplement them, obviously, and then to monitor them over time. So Chris, uh, sometimes the therapy with pancreatic enzyme replacement doesn't seem to be working. When that happens in a patient, what do you think about and what do you do in order to improve the effectiveness of this therapy? I think the first thing to think about is to look at the dose. And the most common explanation for failure is that the dose that was prescribed was inadequate. Right. Uh, second most common might be that you prescribed a sufficient dose, but the patient's not able to take them, may not be able to afford the drug or may not be able to tolerate that many pills. So those are two things that are very common. If you have the right dose and the patient's taking it, um, the next strategy might be to consider the addition of an agent to reduce gastric acid. It will force these enteric coated preparations to open more proximally in the GI tract. And if you can get those enzymes released in the duodenum, you maximize uh, uh, fat absorption and other uh, absorption of other nutrients. And then last, if that's uh, not effective, I do consider the possibility that there may be a coexistent illness which is also driving malabsorption or maldigestion. And two to think about might be small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which is fairly common in these folks. And occasionally you'll see patients with celiac disease as well, where treatment may have a benefit both for the pancreatic exocrine insufficiency and for the celiac disease. So those are two things to think about in those in whom it's not a dose issue and it's not an acid issue. So the symptoms of bacterial overgrowth and maldigestion are very similar. Uh, how do you distinguish the two and what, do you, what makes you suspect bacterial overgrowth? Uh, for us, we uh, suspected in patients in whom, in chronic pancreatitis patients who are not responding to the right dose of enzyme and are still having bloating, gas, uh, still losing weight, right. those kinds of symptoms. We n normally perform a xylose breath test at the University of Florida. Many institutions do not have access to that, so they may do a hydrogen breath test. But another clue to those folks is a high serum folate. So if 
I see a patient with chronic pancreatitis who's not responding as they should. They still have some diarrhea and bloating and they have high serum folate. I'll generally treat them empirically. A couple conditions in which uh, uh, initiating uh, pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy is not a lifelong thing, but it can be used as a bridge. So, uh, for example, uh, some patients with celiac disease, when it's flaring, may have pancreatic insufficiency and uh, therapy with, with the pancreatic enzymes uh, can be useful in order to uh, improve their nutrition until their uh, disease comes under control. Autoimmune pancreatitis uh, is another uh, example. Do you have much experience with this disease? I do. I mean, it's a fascinating condition that we're all starting to recognize a little right. bit more. And um, the presentation is a little bit different oftentimes than some of the, fakes, the folks we've been talking about. It's more mimics a pancreatic cancer. But it's fascinating that the, the abnormalities on imaging studies can resolve so promptly on steroids right. and so completely. And it's equally fascinating that they can develop exocrine insufficiency, which can resolve with therapy. So this is um, a particular etiology we can point to and say, boy, we really have a, a dramatic and rapid impact when we manage those folks. And the features which would seem to be irreversible are actually quite reversible if you, if you, inter, you, know, if you act in, in time. Right. So kind of to summarize what we've talked about, uh, patients who have uh, uh, steatorrhea, certainly uh, that's evidence they need pancreatic enzyme. A replacement, those with signs and symptoms of maldigestion, bloating, frequent stools, uh, and also those with uh, vitamin deficiencies, failure to gain weight, and uh, other symptoms of maldigestion benefit uh, with uh, enzyme replacement. It may be necessary for a lifetime if their pancreas is destroyed, but there are reversible conditions that we've discussed in which it can be an important bridge. And one we haven't talked about because there's not a lot of good data, but we're fascinated by is people that have had moderately severe acute pancreatitis where there's a time after the acute injury is over and they're recovering where their pancreas doesn't function quite normally, but eventually the function comes back and the timing of that and the importance of giving them nutritional support with pancreatic enzymes remains uh, an area that needs to be uh, further studied. And the other group I might include that we haven't talked about are the folks that have had previous pancreatic resection, either for cancer or for benign disease. And I think those patients are highly likely to be exocrine insufficient. And I think routine supplementation is prudent in that group of patients, whether or not they have some of the symptoms and signs that we've talked about that might warrant you to do that. One of the challenges I have are patients I'm following with chronic pancreatitis who have not yet developed exocrine insufficiency, but I'm worried that they may. And uh, I was wondering how you monitor those folks, how you follow them. I've uh, taken to using fecal elastase testing periodically, but there may be other ways to do it. I was interested in your experience in that. Yeah, I, I don't know what the right answer is. Uh, I think that what um, is beginning to emerge as a practice is to do, make sure that an annual uh, evaluation is done to look for the signs and symptoms of maldigestion and uh, even if they do have mild insufficiency, there is the uh, possibility that they're going to become worse and worse as the pancreas uh, process progresses. And so uh, I think a, an annual evaluation of some type is probably prudent. And I've also taken, um, in, in a sort of a preventative mode, is to putting all my patients with chronic pancreatitis on calcium and vitamin D. Um, because I'm worried that I'm going to miss an opportunity to, to prevent bone loss. Yeah, we would agree with that.